Coach Brad here. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about the Chasing Poker Greatness VIP newsletter. Hopping onto the VIP newsletter is the absolute best thing you can do to ensure this plucky little podcast keeps going indefinitely into the future. When you sign up, you'll get exclusive behind the scenes Chasing Poker Greatness content, access to the private Chasing Poker Greatness Slack community, notifications for product launches, entries into monthly free coaching giveaways, and much, much more. So if you're wondering what the absolute best thing you can do to support your favorite poker podcast, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP and access the newsletter today. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP. And now, back to the show. Poker's legendary champions. Next generation stars and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, my friend, to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson. And today's guest on the show has won a major MTT on every U.S.-friendly poker site and is one of the most popular coaches in the game today, Jared God's Big Toe Gabin. Toe has been in and around the game of poker since the early 2000s and has been playing off of the same bankroll that began with a $5 Poker Stars free roll. And even though he's managed to spin hay into gold over the last couple of decades, what he's most beloved for is giving back to the poker community through his regular poker coaching and Twitch study streams with former Chasing Poker Greatness guest Shondell Pruitt. When it comes to teachers in the world of poker, you'll be hard-pressed to find a more dedicated and passionate guide than God's Big Toe. One of the regular questions I ask on this show is, what does greatness mean to you? And I just want to say that I personally believe making an impact on the folks you interact with, helping to guide the humans you see an earlier version of yourself in along their path, and being patient and generous with the wisdom you have gained over the years, are a massive part of what makes someone great to me, and Jared has all of these traits in spades. In today's episode, you'll learn how Jared spun up his role from the aforementioned $5, why poker has been such a consistent part of Jared's life over the last couple of decades, how Jared still feels when meeting and interacting with the folks who have made an impact in his poker career, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you the one and only Jared God's Big Toe, Gavin. Jared, good morning, sir. How are we doing? It's doing good. I was saying, uh, you know, just kind of shaking off the Sunday blues and uh, getting ready to hit it again on Monday. Why blues? Oh, you know, I think... Uh, Sundays, you have more losing Sundays than, than winning Sundays on average. Right. So it sucks, you know, well, it sucks that like, you know, you have like 1500 in cashes and still down a grand on the day, you know, but I've been in this life a long time, shake it off, kiss the wife, take a shower, hit it again on Monday. Let's go. Yeah. The Sundays can also be good though. Right. I mean, they can make your year, you know, you have, you have one good Sunday that makes your year. Right. Uh, yeah, so but, the rare, the rare, amazing Sunday does not make for Monday blues. That's true. That's true. The break even Sundays are okay too. You know, I figure throw three or four k up and break even. That's an all right day, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, speaking of Sundays, slinging three or four k out there. Tell me the story of how you got into cards. What does that look like? Interesting. Um, I hated it with a passion at first. When I was in my young 20s, college days, everyone was playing home games. It was right during the moneymaker boom. Um, And at the time, I mean, I was literally sleeping on couches and and struggling for work and all these things. So that $20 home game was, you know, the day's food and, and, you know, a pack of smokes that I was risking. And to lose that was 
it was heartbreaking. Um, and at the time, I didn't really have strategy. So then I decided that I was only going to play the best hand. I was going to play aces, kings, queens, things like that. Only play the best hands. And I took third. And uh, I ended up winning $60. And uh, I now I had food, cigarettes, and a six-pack of beer. It was the greatest day of my life. How old and, were you? Uh, what year is this? Young 20s. Uh, yeah, so what's that? Just about 20 years ago or so. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it was great. Um, and then I kind of got hooked from that point. I ended up um, – I was. I, I'm from Los Angeles originally. So I was uh, on ESPN looking up Lakers scores. And I noticed they had an ESPN poker club up there. And so I checked it out, and it was a free site. It played for points. And I used to call it the point grind. I mean, if you grinded out a certain amount of points, you would make it to the semis. If you got top 50 in the semis, you can win your way into the finals. And then if you win the finals, you got like a WPT entry and things like that. And um, you'll notice like I have all these hats behind me. Um, I have like ESPN Poker Club hats. And like, yeah, you win a bunch of stuff. And my first try, I made it to the finals. I made it to the semis. I made it to the finals. I thought it was Danny Negreanu. It was my, one of my many Danny Negreanu moments in my career where I thought, this is it. We're, we're famous. And uh, from that point, I was hooked. I, I went out and bought my first poker strategy book with my wife. It was our second date before she was my wife. And um, So your second date business. with your wife, you went to buy a poker book. I did, yeah. How'd, that, how, how'd she react to that? I, mean, I guess pretty well, right? I'm really like, lucky. Um, my wife is amazing, and she's incredibly supportive. And it's lucky that when we first met, I was already doing that point grind all the time. When we weren't hanging out, I was just playing the play money, you know, poker. Trying did you to, have a job when you're on the point grind? What, what did uh, your life Yeah, like? I've always had, like, I've been in IT for 25 plus years. So I've always had that. And uh, at this point in my career, I still do that because um, I make a really good living that way. And I like PTO and, and, and insurance for my kids and stuff. If I was in my 20s now, I would totally make a run at the pro life. But at the time, I, I, I already had, you know, kind of the things, those things going on. And um, yeah, so. Uh, it's good to have a redundancy, especially when you have re- responsibilities, mm-hmm. people who count on you to have a solid stream of income. This is one of the more necessary things about being a poker player. Yeah, I think I'm really fortunate. Um, I have a lot of friends that have just the poker life. And for me, because I don't have to necessarily live off of my role, it just grows, you know, and I don't have to worry about swings as much. And, you know, when you have to take money out to pay your bills and then grow your role at the same time, that's a lot of winning that people, I think, underestimate, you know, be able to be successful. And And stress levels too, right? Like Growing wife and kids. I mean, it's so much stress. It's insane. A lot more. Yeah. And for me, like I'm lucky I've, I've gotten to build that role. I, I use that money to pay for vacations and anything I need around the house and, you know, medical bills, if those come up, like it pays for all that stuff. So um, I'm really fortunate that I have a, a side hustle that does pretty well and well enough to, to pay for those things. And I don't have the stress as much. So you're on your second date. Let's go back, rewind go back. to second date. You, you buy your poker book, you have a job at it. You're, you're mm-hmm. on the point grind just mm-hmm. in your free time. What did the point grind lead to? Oh, so, uh, I mean, I was doing that forever. Um, it was pre black Friday. So I was playing free money and, and play role. Um, let's try that again, play money and free rolls, uh, on poker stars and full tilt. And then it was really a breaking point for me. Two things happened right back to back. Uh, stars had an, a, a promotion where they gave a free five bucks and you, whatever you want on it, you could keep. And if you didn't use it in two weeks, they would take the five bucks back. And I was able to run that up to like two or 300 bucks playing dollar sitting goes. Um, so then I had a, a roll. Um, and then shortly after that, I won a 30,000 man free roll um, that took me to the PCA. And I got to make a final table, a TV table in 2009. Poker Stars and Caribbean Adventure for those. Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure. I was on Team USA uh, with Greg Raymer. We were just hanging out, he and I, uh, two weekends ago. He was on my study stream. How come nice. you hadn't made a deposit and waited for the five dollar free roll? I was broke as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my young twenties, living by the beach in Los Angeles. I had a wife and two, well, I had a, at the time she was my fiance, and um, she had kids, so I instantly had a family to take care of. I've been with them since they were they were five, and uh, so yeah, like I just had responsibilities, I, and that's kind of why I never really tried to live off my role because I instantly had to think about a family. 
for people who have families and lots of us do, what do you suggest to ba- do the balancing act between being responsible, taking care of your family while also playing poker and investing yourself into God, this game? I think it's really difficult. And if you're like a micro grinder, it's, it's a really big struggle. Um, I was saying this before, like, I'm really lucky. My wife is super supportive and, and, you know, free rolling to the Bahamas helps. I think before that it was a more of, you know, maybe you're spending a little too much time, too much money. And then you get to the Bahamas and she's like, maybe you should take this Sunday and go play poker, (laughs) you know? Um, So, I mean, winning always helps. Um, That buys you a lot of, a lot of street cred with the wife. Um, Because I'll admit, like I've missed over the years, I've missed a, a ton of family dinners, you know, and, um, especially grinding on the on the west coast like my prime time is between noon and like 7 p.m 8 p.m 9 p.m i'm always playing in those times and so I, I miss a ton of family dinners um and so any regrets about those family dinners sure um yeah uh, definitely definitely you know there's some regret there at the same time i make sure like i have scheduled out family days and like saturdays i do my study stream and then after that it's always time of day. We always make sure to, even if we just go get breakfast at a restaurant, you know, we always do something. Um, this Saturday, we just got in the car, hit a drive through got some Cokes and fries, and then just toured down the strip to see what it was like because I lived in Vegas, just to see what was going on outside. Didn't actually go into a casino, but uh, just to get out and be together. And then also, like, I plan off time. Like, it's important to take time off. This game will beat the hell out of you. So it's good to take time off to keep your mental game strong and to, again, spend that time it's just a matter of juggling. Don't sleep very much. That's a, that's a big one. You know, yeah, it's tough though. If you want to be a toe, you know, or a, a grinder, it's really hard. Cause you have to put in, not only do you have to put in 30, 40 hours a week plus playing, but you have to put in 15, 20 hours a week studying, you know, just to stay on top of the game. So it's a huge commitment. It really is. I think people really underestimate how hard you have to work just to get by at the mid stakes, because if you're not guys like me are, and you're just going to get, you're going to get passed up eventually. Yeah. When they say grind, they do really mean it is a grind It is a day in and day out process for improving and maintaining your mental state and growing as a poker player, because in the online world, if you're not growing, everybody else is, and you will get left behind right? You will one day wake up. And I I always think about it like, you know, the old man coffees in a casino who in the nineties and early two thousands just played like nits and made money Mm -hmm. and stopped studying, stopped growing, stopped being curious and thinking about the game in depth. And one day they showed up at the casino and they were no longer profitable players. And they didn't realize it for years. They just felt like they were getting unlucky. But what had happened, the reality was that poker had passed them by without them even realizing what was happening. And this is something that you're always fighting against as a poker player. You're always trying to evolve and learn and grow. So loving the learning and growth process is just paramount to finding success and, and, you know, reaching poker greatness. Yeah. I mean, you've got a couple of points there that kind of remind me, if you think back to all the guys who are on TV all the time, like the vast majority of those guys are just not around anymore. Now you have the guys who stand out for the Ivy and the Grande, those guys, but like, you know, like, I don't want to, I don't want to shit on anybody, but you know, like Ted Forrest, he, he was on TV all the time. Where's Ted Forrest? I don't even know. You know, um, well, if you you've know, read the banker, guys, <laughs> the, yeah. the banker, what is it? The professor, the banker and the suicide King. I think we can realize Ted Forrest probably didn't have the best bankroll management <laughs> situation. I think that was a lot of those guys, right. You know, yeah. but even like Gus Hansen, you know, crushing the game and then pass the by. And, you know, as you know, I coach uh, a lot too, and I hear a lot, a lot from the older players, like I've been playing for 30 years. Why do I need to get coaching? And that's why you can beat your local one, two game. But, online comes across as rigged right the truth is, is online's harder and those guys are killers and they study and and the other thing you brought up too is like there's so many resources out there right now and so many ways to get better and i think the general public is just really good you know it's so much better than they were 
in 2009 when I knitted my way to a free roll win and got to the PCA, you know, um, the me now would destroy the me then. I, you know, I just played good cards and played good flops and that was it. It's easy. And ran pretty well. I think that's always, Key. always a crucial ingredient to doing anything, uh, especially in the MTT world of poker. Mm. Uh, tell me about the PCA. So you, your wife, you, you bink this free roll. Mm-hmm. What were you feeling? What did the tournament look like? Like uh, it was incredible. Um, what happened was, is I was playing, and there was there was a couple of steps. Um, there was you could they had this like uh, state based way you can win. So I got to compete against all the people in California, and there was a couple of tournaments, free world tournaments that you can play, and and based on where you lived, you could play. And I didn't do very well in that. And then at the very end, they had what was called a national championship, and so anyone in the U.S. could play. And it was two 30,000 man free rolls and the top nine from both of those free rolls then competed in an 18 man, uh, like sit and go uh, at the sit and go the first hand. I don't remember the exact dynamics of the hand cause it was so long ago, but I remember getting knocked down to three chips, not even blinds and then sun running back to win it. Wow. And uh, after that, we all got split into like these different six man sit and goes. And it was, I was on team USA one and then it was like when well, New Hampshire was a team and, Connecticut was a team and there was all these different teams. And, um, I ended up winning my little sit and go there. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but Sean Deeb was on my team and he won his and Ben Zamani, who's a little less known, but he's got a, I think a couple of bracelets in the WPT and stuff. He's a really good player. Um, he won his sit and go. And the other free roll player was an old man who got some sort of free slots play. Didn't even show up for the final leg. And because the three of us did so well, this son of a bitch won his way to the Bahamas without showing up. How did uh, that happen? Uh, because uh, he had, he took second place in that 18 man against me. And then in that little six max end, he just blinded out. I think he got like fourth or fifth <laughs> or something. And that was enough to get team USA to win. So when it all ended uh, right on the lobby of poker stars, there was a banner. It said, congratulations, team USA won. You've won your trip to the PCA. And I looked at my wife and I was like, babe, I think, I'm not sure. But I think I just want a trip to the goddamn Bahamas. I, I think I'm too young to say one, like, but you don't believe that's really going to happen, right? Like, it just doesn't happen to people, right? And then, uh, yeah, the article came out and, holy hell, I went my way to the Bahamas. Um, so I had to get a passport, which was fun. And my wife got a passport. And my wife is so funny. She's from a, a very small town in Montana. So she was like really freaked out about leaving the country. Like, you know, we're going to Paradise Island. This is not. You know, this is, we couldn't go to a better place, Bahamas. And when we got there, it was amazing. You know, you land in and you're driving through um, the beach and you get to the Atlantis, which is gorgeous. And I didn't know this at the time, but I get to my nice fancy hotel room and I had a big bag full of swag. So Superstar shirts and duffel bags and hats and things. And uh, you're walking around and there's all these famous players. It was a dream, man. There was all these famous players around. I have pictures with all crazy sorts of players, some infamous, you know, like I have a, Nice picture of me and Chris Ferguson. He's all full tilted out before Black Friday and stuff like that. And uh, next thing you know, I, I'm sitting at a table and uh, I actually emailed Sean Deeb not knowing who he was. I was like, hey, I thought he was a free roll winner. I was like, if you want to get some food and hang out, he didn't reply. <laughs> at the time I was hurt. Now I understand. Um, and then Raymer actually hit us up. He said, I want to take the whole team out to lunch. So then I'm, I'm you sitting say at the team, table. What does it mean? Like. So there was, was five that of team. Uh, each of us played a blind level. We came up with a, a rotation of who was going to play first. And then at any time you could kind of sub in and sub out. So if we sat down and noticed that like in my rotation, it was all the pros, each, each team, um, there was team USA, team Canada, team Latvia, team uh, Great Britain. And each one had a pro as, as their captain. So if in the rotation, it turned out that I was playing with all the pros, we could sub out, put Sean in, put Greg in, put someone with more experience in play against that and then kind of switch us around. How many teams um, were there? Don't remember. I want to say there was six or eight teams. I vaguely remember this event, like the seeing it on TV with like team USA, team Canada. And yeah. Yeah. And all Negron of these different things. The team Canada leader. Right. And um, when I sat down, the very first thing I had, I had Negrano directly to my right. And I was like, Oh my God, like, what's going on here? Like the, the, this is the dream for players and also the kind of a nightmare. Like, you know, that guy knows what you have at all times. And so what's the plan? Like just run good. Right. Or that's what you think, right? Like this is what you think in the moment that he always yeah. knows. 
Sure. And I think at the time too, like, I mean, even now Nagano's a world-class player. I'm, I'm, he's no doubt better than me, obviously. But even at the time, like he was leaps and bounds better than your random free roll player. Right. He's a, Oh, for sure. The icons. Right. Right. And so like, I, yeah, I was scared. I was scared. And you're on TV and you don't want to screw up when everyone's going to see, but you got to, you know, luckily I, I competed in sports my whole life too. So there's a lot of being able to kind of put that aside and just play your A game as best you can, you know? Um, yeah. How'd you do? How'd you, uh, how'd you? We ended up taking fourth. Uh, we were chip leading. Uh, Sean was up and got terrible beats twice, rejammed his pocket eights back to back and lost both of them. And uh, we ended up busting fourth. Uh, my cut of that was 6K, and it was like the most money I'd ever seen in my life. It was crazy. And uh, I'm still playing off that 6K. I've never deposited in my life. My bank was started there. And um, lucky for me, because I was so broke when I started and losing that money was so detrimental, I've always been a roll knit. And so I'm still playing off that money today. Sometimes I think maybe a roll knit to my detriment a little bit. I don't think I moved up as quick as I should have. And I didn't take as many risks as I should have. And so now, you know, that's obviously changed. I'm playing everything you can in the U.S. online. So, uh, but I think it definitely hindered me a little bit. Um, but yeah, still on that money today. It's, you know, it's all about the journey, right? And all about the individual situation. And for you, like I was just a 21-year-old kid that if I went broke, then I'd just drive back home, turn tail, live with my parents for a little while and get a job and save money and like no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. When like in your situation with tons of risk, risk aversion becomes kind of key to Mm -hmm. keeping this thing going because not only does risking money when you don't really have it to risk, like affect your mental state, it affects relationships, you know, with your significant other, it affects your kids, like it just affects everything. So it's very pragmatic to me that, yeah, you you had some risk aversion because you had a lot to risk. (laughs) Whereas me as a 21 year old really didn't have so much to risk. Like who cares if I lose everything I have, I don't have that much anyway. And whatever, I just, I have an out, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, good and bad. You know, like I, I've been around for so long that like I've kind of fallen into all the pitfalls you could possibly fall into. I've jumped stakes too soon and got crushed and had to drop back down and build the roll back up. And, and I've played every variant of poker there is. And, and I've seen all the different, like, you know, different trends from when sitting goes were hot and now poker, you know, tournaments are hot, and, you know, dabbling in cash games, all those things. And I've, I've kind of, you know, I've, dealt with I've seen a lot of bad deals go down and now like I, it's kind of nice being you know I'm, I'm 42 years old I've been doing this a long time and I don't have a lot of the life leaks that that most players have like my mental game is strong my bankroll is untouchable you know for the stakes that I play and I, it's it's nice you know looking back now that you know, I'm living the nice you know easy life you know right um, it's good it's really good. when after you bink right you get your 6k PCA, you fly home. What did poker look like? You said this was 2009. So that was my first Daniel Negreanu moment. So the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to reinvest in myself uh, immediately. So it was the very next day. Uh, poker starts at the time at poker school. I don't remember exactly what they called it, but Negreanu had a class and the, um, damn it, I always space on his name, but they had that CIA guy who was like Joe Navarro. Yeah, there you go, Joe Navarro. And so I took that class. Um, so I, I, I was hanging out the next day with, with Greg Raymer. We were having a beer. It's a weird thing to say. But uh, I was like, How yeah, come? I think I'm going to reinvest Why is that weird? Uh, because I'm, I'm, at the time, I was, you know, I mean, even now, like, just hanging out with them last weekend. I just, you know, those guys are famous. And I feel like, you know, it's, a, it's weird to, you know, to be a, I don't want to say a nobody, but a nobody, you know, and then saying, yeah, I was hanging out with Greg Raymer. You know, uh, you know, a little boast there, but it's weird. It's interesting now because at this stage of my life, I have a lot of friends that a lot of people know. You know, being hooked up with the poker coaching guys got me into a lot of famous players, and I I still sit in awe. You know, um, I'm I'm pretty good friends with Matt Affleck, and when he hits me up on on Skype to study, I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm just gonna go study with Matt. What the hell? What life do I live right now? That that guy that I watched on TV. I'll take that nasty beat in the main event. And now we're friends. Weird. 
so weird. Uh, it's almost like living in a dream. I'm, I'm really lucky, really fortunate, and really um, aware of how lucky and fortunate I am, which is, which is good. Yeah, the poker community is actually fairly accessible and fairly small, fairly tight knit. Uh, in my experience doing podcasting because I've been a cash game player my whole career and cash game players have no hindered mob. They get no press or Mm -hmm. publicity. They grind day in and day out sort of under the radar privately. And so it was kind of odd to me that like I didn't really have poker connections when I started this podcast. And then it Mm -hmm. was, just doing cold outreach. And some of my friends who are unknowns, but in the cash game world play super big and they have, you know, like friends of friends were people that I could get in touch with. And then like, it's once you have a good experience with one of them, they're very open and for other things, right. They're just, they're just folks, you know, I, I I realized that like all the existential crises that I've had in, in poker are similar to people who have had tons of success and have made tons of money. They feel the same existential crisis. They go through the same downswings. They go through the same thing. It's like, you know, really we're kind of all one and the same as far as that shared experience goes. It's just some people ran super well Mm -hmm. in at exactly the right time, right? Like Greg Raymer just decided one year, I'm going to win a bajillion E flips. I'm going to run really well at the exact right moment of the poker boom and then bam he's famous like overnight effectively right um yeah it's it's a it's a weird it's a it it can be an odd world it's interesting too because like you know in my eyes when i see raymer and affleck and jonathan little all those crazy guys like those are the michael jordans of 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 my passion which is poker right and so to hang out it's like you know going to play a you know let's just do a little pickup game with with kobe bryant or LeBron James or whoever, you know what I mean? Like I still feel that way even now, which is, which is, it's actually nice. And like I said, I'm honored and humbled. Um, But what I find interesting is, um, you know, how, like you said, accessible these guys are They're in the end, you're right. They're just normal people. And so like um, I've had some cold outreach too, for the, for the study stream that I do. And um, using Jesse is Jesse Sylvia. We had on the stream a little while ago and I never talked to him before in my life. I never met him. And we had a friend of a friend, like you said, and I just reached out and he just said yes. And then they were randomly replaying that world cup, world cup of poker on, on Twitch. And someone tagged me and Raymer. I haven't talked to him in 10 years. And I just reached out and said, Hey, Greg, just taking a shot in the dark. And he just said, yes, these guys are just super, super easy going. You know, it's, yeah. it's good. In a worst case scenario, I know that for the listener, one of the major struggles that you have is finding people to study with, to grow with, building a network, a community that is supportive of your poker aspirations. And the worst that can happen when you want to connect with somebody is they just say no. And where you're at, right? That's not that bad. It's an asymmetrical risk where the downside is very, very small with a massive, massive upside. So I've said it many times and I'll say it again. Don't be shy. Don't feel like you have to weather the storm all by yourself. Reach out to folks. There are tons of people who are happy to help other folks navigate their poker journey because they've gone through it in a lot of cases by themselves. And they understand that the journey can be lonely and it can be arduous and it can require us to be strong in ways that we don't even know we have to be or that we are capable of. So having a support system is just, it's so pivotal. I would say that the first five years or so of my career, I have every poker book you can see behind me that's ever been written. And I was hanging out with two friends that we would study together, but I was always the best player. And the best thing I ever did was find poker friends. I think that is the number one thing you can do to improve is just find people to talk hands with and find, you know, even if the first group of people you find are, you're all kind of equals, eventually you're going to find someone who's better, who will kind of help steer you. And it's good to have all levels, guys that are a little behind you so you can reinforce your basics and keep going over those kind of things and and coach a little bit. Um, Guys who are equal to you. um, So you don't feel so alone. And then guys that are better than you kind of help you steer the course and all together that uh that comes from winning thing the best thing i ever did was 
actually hook up with crazy sixes was one of the best things I ever did in my career because that, that changed everything um, for me. And before that uh, I was a part of, I was in a, a group um, that was very similar to the group that I formed. Um, it was a coaching community is what they called it. And it was basically, you had to apply and the guy who led it would let, I don't know how he vetted people, but he would vet people. And when you got in, it was just a bunch of group of guys who were just trying to be good and, and get better together. And he would kind of steer the way. Um, he got a coaching deal for a staking community that was pretty well known. And um, um, he ended up disbanding the group. And so now I was left alone again. And I was like, what am I going to do? That's why I started streaming. Um, I was like, I need to find poker friends. So I just got on Twitch and uh, started talking to myself until people started to listen. <laughs> and then that got me in touch with Sixes, who then got me in touch with um, some other people who then got me in touch with the poker coaching guys. So now I study with these guys that are great. And uh, it was the best thing ever. Um, it's the best way to fast track, too, because when you're dealing with people who have been there already, you know, you can skip all that trial and tribulation part and Get well, they have the path, books. right? Yeah. There's like yeah. a blazed path you can follow versus yeah. trying to figure it all out on your own. Yeah. And Crazy Sixes, uh, Shondell Pruitt, former Chasing Poker Greatness guest, uh, is your, you know, you, you run the study stream with him, right? You two. I do. Yeah. And he and I, what was funny was um, the way we got hooked up was it was three years ago, I believe. And they just started those tag team events in the World Series. And I had a bunch of friends in town. And at the time, I was uh, one of the ACR Stormers, um, one of their main streamers. And so was, so was Sean and a couple other people. And I knew they were in town. And I hit them up. I was like, we should have a, a Stormer team for the tag team. It's only 250 bucks each. It's easy. We got to shut out the bracelet. It's great publicity for all of us and our streams. Let's do it. And nobody was interested. And then it was the night before at like 5 p.m. And I was coming home from work. And my phone started blowing up. And uh, Sixes was like, yeah, I'm in. I was like, oh. Shit, let me try and find some other people. And then uh, Poker Pass Your Streams Now was in. And I was like, wait, we have a team. This is great. And then we ended up making a run and busting 24th. And uh, through the course of that, uh, Sixes and I just started talking hands. And, you know, and we were like, oh, you know what? We really get along and think a lot alike. We should, we should start studying together. And that was three years ago. And I can't tell you like, how great that was for my career. Um, you know, I, both of us have, have, one, got connections, and two, gotten so much better um, because of that and and just continue to grow i was saying we were studying right before this call we studied five days a week wow that's yeah we talk we talk every day pretty much um, so one of the greatest things i ever did yeah, absolutely and as you like to say and i like to say as well you know iron sharpens iron so you get somebody that's similar to you you help each other you grow together and i will circle back a little bit to the point of having people worse than you in a study group. Mm -hmm. And I've always looked at that as being so beneficial because if a player is worse than you, say a recreational player who's struggling at whatever, 100, no limit, right? When they analyze hands, you can see their thought process in real mm -hmm. time. So you see how recreational players or losing players think their way through hands, which as a winning player is very, very beneficial because, you know, you need to meet people on their own paradigm. You need to meet people on their own level. This is, you know, pivotal to maximize your thought process and make great decisions when you're playing poker. And so if you understand how people are thinking, then it just lead you to making better decisions against them in the future. And then you can also, they see how you think, right? And they see the gaps that their thought process is missing. They see the gaps in their knowledge and experience. And this gives them a target to work on and improve and become more advanced. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial thing. And like you said, you need people all across the spectrum, people who are better than you, people who are worse than you, and people who are around your same skill level. And then just everybody benefits mutually and it's a together. good situation all around. You grow together. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I find like, cause I do a lot of coaching and then I get hit up a lot on the side for people like, you know, what do you think about this hand and whatnot? And I'm, and, and the streaming too, just talking every hand through all the time. Like you just, your fundamentals get so solid, you know, the basics just get down and like, you know, your push fold game and your call offs, all that kind of stuff just gets so solid because you're always talking about that stuff and you're always running hands and you're just, 
you know, my whole life is poker. And then I have this IT career that, that, you know, helps supplement that. But anytime I'm not doing that, like my whole life is poker in one way or the other. Um, you said you grew up in LA and mm-hmm. you live in Vegas now. Mm-hmm. What led to that move? Poker specifically? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, you know, I grew up in LA, uh, born and raised. And then um, I realized that even though I made a good living, if I ever wanted to retire, you know, like I said, I'm 42, so I'm not planning on retiring too soon. But if I don't want to work for that group, and if I ever want to retire, you know, living in LA, it's near impossible with a family. It's just so expensive. And so uh, I realized that I needed to make some life change. Uh, both my wife and I both are old punk rockers. And so we never really thought about the future or retirement getting old and then i blinked i'm I'm 42 my wife is 49 and so we're like oh shit we're old like (laughs) (laughs) Uh we better better make some plans and uh so we had to make some life changes it was actually my wife who landed on vegas um it's close enough to where if i want to go visit my family my nieces my sisters and stuff um it's an easy drive drive. and also there's no state income tax here so i realized once i realized i can make 800 bucks more a month just doing the same exact job from chair i'm sitting in now i was gone two months later um flash forward to now i've been here six years um i have zero debt we have a nice little savings account going on um so it worked you know and uh yeah i mean it was more of a a necessity i never thought i would leave and now that i'm gone i don't think i'll ever go back there to live even though i think it's one of the greatest places in the world and it's always going to be home it's just too damn expensive yeah that's why it's so expensive because LA is amazing and the weather is perfect and it's just, it's an awesome city. I've spent a lot of time in LA and there's a reason why, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of people live there Mm -hmm. and why the price of like a two bedroom apartment is typically around 2,500 bucks because there's a lot of demand and not a ton of supply. I pay $1,600 a month rent right now. I have a yard. I'm one of the three people in Nevada that has grass. (laughs) It's phenomenal. You know, three bedroom, four bathroom house. Like, it's great. For the poker, for somebody aspiring in poker, Mm -hmm. how has Vegas affected your career being closer to a bunch of people that are in the industry? You know, what's funny is that um, I've always been the online guy. Um, It's just easier. It's, it's, I can get more volume in Um, just from a business aspect. I can get more volume in. And so I could beat variants easier that way with a family and a day job. It's really easy for me to just come home and you know, get 15 tables going up in no time, which helps. And so I play live, but I mostly during the series. Um, and then without that, there's a couple of speckled in tournaments, um, you know, throughout the year. But uh, what's really cool in Vegas is during the series when all my friends from all over the country are in town and there's a barbecue here and then we all go play this event and you're getting railed and we all go meet at the bar to tell our sob story or or our success (laughs) story, whatever it might be. And um, there's all, there's all sorts of things going on. It's like such a fun time. It's like summer camp. I'm really sad because right now is primetime world series. And because of this craziness, it's not going on right now. So that part sucks. But uh, yeah, that was the greatest thing ever. I didn't realize how fun the world series is when you, when you live here and all your friends are here. Yeah. It's like summer break. It's, it's summer, amazing. summer vacation. Everybody flies in, hangs out. It's a good time. My boss is really cool. He's a, he's a, a weekend warrior player. And so, um, he, you know, I, I fascinate him. And so we have a standing agreement during the world series. He's really understanding. I'm like, I know I need this day off. It might turn into four days off. I might be back the next day. Um, and he's totally flexible. Like, that's me. And then I'd come in. He's like, Oh, why are you here? Aren't you playing today? I was like, Oh no, no, tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll be gone. And he follows me on social media. He follows my stream. Uh, that's so, awesome, yeah, man. That's, uh, Sounds like cool. you've you've managed to surround yourself with people who are supportive. Of I built a endeavors. life that's really conducive to being a poker player. I'm fortunate that I was able to do that. Really fortunate. How important do you think that's been to your I, poker aspirations? You have to. Like I said, you have to be. I wrote a, a blog one time. Uh, blessed to be obsessed. You you have to be obsessed. Um, it, it depends on what you want. You know, if you want to be that guy who's making a bunch of money every year and, and try and get some accolades and, and grow stakes and, and be one of the best. You have to be obsessed. If you want to get a better and beat your local home game and have some fun weekend stuff, you know, you don't necessarily have to go as crazy as I do. 
Um, but if you really want to be that guy, if you want to be a me, you want to be a sixes, you want to be a Matt Affleck, you know, something like that. Um, and you have to be obsessed. There's no other way around it. Um, Cause like you said, those guys are obsessed and then you just get passed by. And with the, with the speed of information and all the stuff that's available to you right now, you can pass by it at lightning fast pace. Um, and again, like the other thing too is, you know, I refer to Bruce Lee, you have to be water because this game is always changing. And so you have to be fluid um, and you have to be, you know, willing to change with it. When you say changing, do you have a concrete example of the game of poker changing? Sure. Um, back in the day when you three bet, you three bet with ace king and aces and queens and kings. And that was about it. Right. And now you have all sorts of, you know, three bets and even like terminology has changed, you know, like, you know, merged ranges and being balanced and, you know, things like that, like just didn't exist back in the day. Um, and back in the day in 2009, when I was playing those free rolls and stuff, I, like I said, I just played the best hands and, you know, bet them for value and check folded when I didn't have value and you could be easily successful. And today you'll just get run over by guys like me if you're, if you're doing that, right? You just, easy. You know? Yeah, because if you're paying attention, then it's very easy strategy to counter for sure. just somebody who's paying attention. It's like, oh yeah, you're pl- only playing good hands. You're playing pretty nitty. I'm just going to raise you very, very often. And when you play back at me, I'm just going to fold and good night moon. You have no chance. I win nine hands. You win one. I win nine hands. You win one. Right. The, The, I think that's the biggest, like the biggest misnomer that I've found in a cash game career is like the mentality of I'm going to play nitty. And eventually this loose aggressive player is just going to give me all of their money. And the reality of it is, is that when you are loose aggressive and you're constantly applying pressure to people, you get a good sense of when is not a good time to try to exploit somebody through bluffing them. You get a very good sense of what this person is doing. And so what ends up happening is, you know, you get three bet over and over and over again, you get ISO raise over and over and over again, and then the whole time you're thinking, just wait, wait until I have it. And then yeah. I get all the money and then you have it. And that's the time they just fold. And yeah. you're like, Oh, that, that was, that didn't work out so well. So like well, three blind pot isn't going to make up for all the, all the losses, right? Exactly. So you have to fight fire with fire. And in order to do that, you have to understand what's happening. You have to gain a clear view of what's happening in this game that so that I can make adjustments so that I can counter their strategy so I can make their life more difficult. There's nothing that's more painful and annoying to a loose aggressive player than getting three bet and getting four bet and somebody that's just on you and not letting you breathe. They're just suffocating you. This is the most frustrating thing. Like a lag wants you to play tight and nitty and stay in line so that they can just bleed you dry. Yeah, I would say like my aggression makes it easier to play because people turn their hands face up. They get uncomfortable and then they just are checking you on a lot of flops and you get to see bet. And when they when they when you when you three bet pre and then see bet the flop and they're still there, kind of you can narrow ranges and kind of figure out where you're at. Um, I was just saying this uh, with sixes in that group right before this. Like the people I hate to play against the most are the, my students and sixes. And that's because those guys hear me talk poker and see my hands all the time, every day. And I'm like, my, my light three bet here is not going to work, you know, because they know, and I know that they know that they know that I know. Right. And so like, I'm so uncomfortable. Um, I'd rather play, you know, anybody, anybody, but the people that know me that well, <laughs> those are the hardest people. for me. You, you get in the meta of it. You get in the game within a game. And then this is another thing that's always just made poker fun to me. The game within the game of, I'm going to do this. How do I think they're going to respond? What's my counter based on their response? And you just keep going down to each little level down the rabbit hole. And it's engaging. It's engaging for me. That, that is fun. Uh, mm-hmm. It's never been fun just like finding a good hand and firing at it super hard. And like that to me, okay, that's, that's okay. 
but it's way more fun to play more pots, to be aggressive, to think, be creative, because in a lot of ways, I think no limit hold 'em, especially, you know, there's an art to it that is understated, that is hard to quantify, that is beautiful and it makes the game fun. And I, I've just always loved that aspect of it. Yeah, me too. Uh, the battle of the minds is something that's always intrigued me. And also, you know, I was a, I was a competitive athlete for most of my life. And now that I'm a little beat up and older that I can't do that stuff anymore. Like this is how I get my competitive edge, you know, or that competitive fix rather. Um, and so like, uh, that's why I play tournaments. I love standing on top of the heap with that. Yeah. And then even the agony to feed them. No, like I need that emotional something like that drives me. And another thing that drives me is um, hanging out with the guys that I do and watching them crush. You know, I have a friend who just won the Sunday warm up on ACR a couple weeks ago. And when he did that, like I couldn't sleep. Like I was super happy for him, but I will not sleep until I get a score that's comparable or a bunch of scores that equal up to something. I needed something. And I'm not kind of crazy. Like that, that stuff drives me. Um, every time Crazy Sixes wins, I have to put up a score in a couple of days. I have to, or I won't sleep. So that I get that fix, you know. Speaking of iron sharpens iron, right? This yeah. is two people who are pushing themselves and striving for greatness and just pushing themselves farther and farther and farther way beyond where either one of you would be without the other one. It's, Absolutely. you know, and yeah, it's, so this game would beat the hell out of you if you let it and, and it gets lonely, you know, like I spent a lot of time in this room. It's a really nice room. <laughs> like I spent a lot of time in this room and so like, yeah, it's good to have, it's good to have a cheering squad, you know, and like that helps too. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. I have a lot of people who are rooting for me and one, I think that drives me to be competitive and, and, and try and win as hard as I can because um, I don't want to let those people down as much as I don't want to let myself down and, and my family down. And, and also like I can hear them. And that stuff drives me. Like I said, I, I tend to show up on game day. I was at athlete for a long time. And so that stuff, you know, I can hear them. And it's helpful. It. It's yeah. Helpful. It, it gives you energy and poker tournaments, especially you do need a lot of energy to go the distance. Any mm-hmm. mental lapse on any single hand can be done. So, and we've, we've all experienced that, I'm sure, too. Yeah, you play 12 hours really good, and then one hand, you just blow completely, and it's, it's a wrap. And you end up with 500 bucks instead of 50000 It happens all the time to people. Uh, yeah. yeah, you got to be strong, man. Especially it's not for the time. weak. Definitely not for the weak. Not for the weak. And I think people, I think that's another thing that recreational players vastly underestimate is the normal variance in tournament poker and how often you just don't cash and uh, how important it is to make those caches you do get, you know, really count to make up for all the normal variants of that stuff. And like, I see a lot of low stakes and and micro stakes player like, yeah, I, you know, I'm in cash this one. I made $4. I made $15. I'm going to play these on demands and get those $7 and spin my way into things. And I think that's all a trap and kind of the wrong mentality. Um, Why? Why do you think that? Uh, min caches don't pay the bills. Just plain and simple. I think you need to be striving to try and win tournaments. For me, I think spins, I don't gamble. And I tell people that all the time. Like I don't gamble, but I spent like $25,000 last month at buy-ins, you know, but I, but I don't gamble at all. Like, you'll never catch me at a fucking slot machine. They'll never catch me. You know, if I have friends that are in town and they want to play blackjack or something because they don't play poker, sure, no problem. You know, but like, I'm never the guy at the craps table. I don't, I don't bet on sports and I don't have any of those leaks. Well, I, I will so, disagree a little bit in that sure. everything is a gamble. And I think that's not thought about often enough. And How do you well, figure? Well, look at COVID, right? Mm-hmm. You have one steady paying job mm-hmm. that you rely on and you count on you are gambling that you do not lose this stream of income, right? Like sure, you have all of your eggs in one basket and it, a lot of people believe that they're bulletproof, that this job equals security. And I think with COVID, what you're seeing is these jobs are not secure and you can lose it effectively overnight. Mm-hmm. And so with anything that you spend, spend your time and invest your time and energy into, you are gambling, right? You're, you're gambling that it will be worth it at the end of the day. So like, but you can I, limit your risk, right? Right. It, I mean, you, you do what you can to limit your risk and that's sure. really all you can do. But when you realize that, you know, MTT professionals, 
uh, are not addicted to gambling. They are doing what they love to do and trying to succeed in this world. Mm-hmm. You, you get a clear picture, right, of just the lifestyle, the goals. That's all I'm really trying to say is like everything is a gamble. Like, sure. so at the end of the day, do what you love and try to minimize risk as best you can. But mm-hmm. bad things will happen. Variant, bad variants will kick in. Good variants comes your way too, right? Like sure, that too. Like life, life could happen. You have to empty your role to pay for something. Sure. Some sort of life tragedy or something. Like sure, start from scratch. Yeah, I mean that's definitely possible. Right. You know, anything, I- anything can happen. Absolutely. Losing your job is a good example too. Like, man, if I lost my my day job, I'd be playing a lot of poker, but we'd be struggling. You know, like that's a, that's a lot of income that I'm guaranteed that doesn't come in. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think the like as a, as a micro player coming up poker related specifically, I think you can. There's a lot of gambling traps that people I think fall into, like spinning in. You know, using ACR's example, I think that's a a huge trap to me. Um, I think if you're trying to build your role, you should use those spin buy ins to buy into something that you're rolled for. Play against people who are generally around the same skill level as you, and try and win tournaments. And versus trying to spin your way into the milli, you know, milli guaranteed, and then get one shot at a dream against a player pool that's probably vastly better than you on average. That yeah. kind of stuff is super trappy, you know? You skip a lot of steps. Yeah. Right? yeah. You, you move up to a division of poker that you are nowhere near prepared enough to be. It's a lottery ticket at that point, right? And most of the time, it's a failing lottery ticket, right? Like most. when you have a bunch of pros who have positive ROIs in these tournaments, well, that positive ROI in a zero sum game is coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And typically it's coming from the folks who are just out of their depth and really have no shot at taking the tournament down. So, you know, stay in your league until you have some results in your league and then try to move up slowly, gradually one step at a time. Yeah. No shortcuts, no shortcuts that I, I believe there's no shortcuts that are long lasting. Like you might take a shot, win a nice tournament, get a nice bankroll, but if you're staying at those stakes and you're not you're not qualified, for lack of a better word, to be there, you're going to go broke eventually just because the skill edge is, is going to get you long term. Right? And there's like ego involved, right? There's arrogance right. and ego. And I think of Jamie Gold, right? Like Jamie Gold wins the main event and then all of a sudden he's on high stakes poker trying to battle against these guys and he's got no shot. Like he, <laughs> he has literally zero shot and then he's playing all the 10ks the 25ks and all of these things thinking that like oh i win one tournament and now i'm a player now i'm qualified to do this for a living i'm a world champion and then it doesn't end super well for you yeah i think using actually raymer as an example i think he was really smart you know he won the main event next year i think he took 24th or 25th and then he was playing at that level for a while and then realized that he's not the guy who's going to crush the high rollers and you are 10 K's on average. So what did he do? He dropped down and plays the HSPT wins five of them, gets player of the year, you know, find again, you know, Jonathan little always says it's find the game you can beat, play the hell out of it and make that money. And uh, I think he was really smart in stepping down and, and doing that and realizing, you know, I think he works on his game. I think he's a good player, but he's, you know, if you're going up against guys like Bryn Kenny and, and Chidwick, and those guys, those guys are just going to crush you long-term, right? Yeah. It's, it, it's all uphill. Um, yeah. but it, it does take some self-awareness to realize to be a world series of poker main event champion. And just to realize that like at the end of the day, a world series of poker main event champion is the winner of a single tournament. Mm-hmm. And without any other resume, that's really all that they have done is one, one single mm-hmm. tournament. And that's, that's great and amazing and a dream for almost every poker player. But that doesn't mean that you're capable of beating a 25K. That doesn't mean that you're capable of being a winning player at a 10K, right? And there's very few guys like like Kata, right? Like Joe Kata, who just wins the main event and then still crushes life after the fact. And you're like, okay, no doubt, you're super legit. <laughs> you know what I mean? More of the guys who win it once and you never hear from them again. Way more of those guys, right? Sure. And we've both been in poker for a long time. And I can't tell you the number of people that have had skill that had ability and just disappear off the face of the world due to Mm -hmm. one trap or another. It just happens all too frequently. 
It's interesting, that team that I was on before I made my own team, um, all those guys were regular crushers. And when that team disbanded, I would say 95% of them or so never played a hand again once the team disbanded. And I, I, I'm so amazed. I'm like, how do you guys, where'd you go? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what happened? How, I, I don't know what I would do Like with all my time. I, I would go crazy. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have this life. You know, like my wife would you know, go do something, get the hell away from me. You know, like I just don't know what I would do my, with, with my life. And I don't know how I would at this point, like, I don't know how I'd ever walk away. Like, and this is know. a good qualifier, right? For somebody yeah. that should be investing time and energy into this journey. If you don't know what you would do without it, this means you love it, Probably that right you have passion for it. You're in the right place. Yeah. So I'm, I've never been afraid of telling my students, anybody that I come in contact with that like, you're not going to make it if that is how I view the situation. Because I, you know, I've seen a lot, I've seen people just disappear with all the talent in the world. And sometimes if you look at poker as a way to generate income and money, and this is the sole way you view it, it's not a great lens. You're going to burn out. You're not going to love the game. And all of this has catastrophic effects on your personal and professional life. So make sure that you love it and not just playing the game. Make sure that you love growing, that you love learning, that you love improving your thought process, overcoming obstacles, being gritty, being like you take pride in losing 20 days in a row and you still get the fuck up and sit in front of your computer and make great decision after great decision. Take pride in that. You know, this is the mentality that is required for long-term success in poker. And some people just don't have that. And that's okay. Like, it's okay to love poker as a hobby. But if you come to me saying you want to do this for a living and I don't see that, then I'm going to say, choose a different path because this is not going to lead to fulfillment and a happy existence at the end of the day. Yeah, they only see the glory moments, right? They don't realize the day in, day out work that you have to put in and, and the, and the real life struggle. Like I said, I think that's one of the vastly underestimated things is, is the normal variance of this life and how tough you have to be. And I guess blessed to be obsessed. You, you have to be obsessed. You have and to I, be. I, I struggled in school um, coming up. I, I struggled in high school. I, I got kicked out of two colleges, <laughs> you know, like I, I struggled, but I study poker five days a week. I, I love it. And when I'm on a downswing, I study more. I enjoy it. I play less and study more. Um, and that helps too. We were talking about surrounding ourselves with good people. Like it really helps when I'm on a downswing and I'm, I'm like, okay guys, we need to look at my stuff um, because I'm, I'm just running like shit. And uh, it really helps when I have crazy sixes and the rest of the guys in my group, like, you know what, Toe, you're playing really well. This was just a bad beat. Let's look at the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fine. This is just normal variance. And it, it helps you keep your head straight. Um, yeah. We're not built for this. Human you know. beings are not built to handle the full-time grind. And it's really hard to make good decisions over and over again, mm-hmm. get your face smashed in and still have a belief that your decisions were correct mm-hmm. all along the way. The only way that you can really get that is by having people review your hands and give you feedback because yeah, you otherwise you start questioning everything. Like, am I just horrible? Am I just making mistake after mistake after mistake? You need somebody to basically just show up help center you, give you some motivation, encouragement, and good feedback. And then you're like, okay, I still know what I'm doing. I'm just running bad. Because believe it or not, when you are running bad, you will try to trick yourself into believing that you could have controlled the situation for a better outcome. And you start getting down on yourself. So having that feedback of like, no, just keep doing what you're doing. It's going to work out at the end of the day. It's so critical. You know, if you don't have that feedback, I imagine this is where a lot of people just disappear off the face of the world because they say, fuck this game. I am horrible at it. I can't win. I'm never going to win. And I don't want to play another tournament ever again for the rest of my life. And then they're done. They're gone. You hear that? Oh, the site's rigged. Site's rigged. Never lucky. All that kind of stuff. One time. Yeah. Yeah. One time. Absolutely, man. Um, Got it. Yeah. Like I'm only as strong as, as the people, as my support group, like you said, and definitely, definitely it's, it's imperative. Um, it's really imperative. And it's funny for me, like I, I can get aces cracked five times in a row and not blink, you know, but another thing that drives me too is when I, when I just blow a hand, you know, like I don't dwell on it, but that's another thing that'll make me 
loosely, you know, like, God, I, I screwed that up, you know, and that was my fault. That gets me, you know, and yeah. then it also helps too, because I, I tend to not make that mistake the next time because I touched the iron and it hurt, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Self-flagellation. You're, yeah. you're punishing yourself. And yeah. I do think that to an extreme that, that can be healthy and it can be very unhealthy if sure. you are too hard on yourself because so practicing self-forgiveness in poker is just necessary because you're working with incomplete information and you're going to make mistakes, period. Every tournament that you play, every cash game you play, every session you have, you're going to make mistakes. So accept that, internalize that, and practice some self-forgiveness while also pushing yourself to minimize those mistakes because really the goal is not to play perfectly and never make mistakes. The goal is to make fewer mistakes than your oh, opponents. Mm -hmm. And this is how you get money at the end of the day. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can't tell you how many times I was like, man, I just came out of a great coaching session or a great study session. And I think the next tournament I played and this was the best tournament I ever played. I played this perfectly. And then we go and review it. And there's always four or five spots. Where I was like, who played this hand? Like, I don't even remember this hand happening. How do we get here? What happened? Right. This, like okay. this is the opposite end of the spectrum, right? When <laughs> right. like, this is the run good when you think you're in control once again, and that you are solely responsible for winning a tournament or ripping off like a 10 game winning cash game streak. Mm -hmm. You think, Oh, I'm not running that well. I'm just, I just turn into this poker monster right. without realizing that like, yeah, you're just running like God. And yeah. nothing can go wrong for you right now. However, if we look at your sessions, you're still making plenty of mistakes. You're right. still there's still room ever. for for growth, right? And that's like you said. I think a lot of people don't seek out coaching when they're running super well. They seek out coaching when they're running really bad. They hit a wall that they don't think they can overcome. And so, you know, I think invest in yourself like you did when you binked your six k when you're running well, invest in yourself then, because then you're not as defensive when you get criticism, you know, you're confident in the decisions that you're making at the table. There's just a lot of things that go hand in hand with running well and getting coaching and growing all at the same time, where you get very defensive when you're running bad, you are embarrassed to show people's hands, you, you, indecisive about pulling the trigger your brain gives you conflicting arguments like i should raise here but if i raise they're going to snap me off i know raising's the right play i don't know what to do okay i'm just going to fold and that's not a methodology that lends itself to finding success at this game in the long run yeah yeah i 100 agree 100 agree you've heard me talk early and often about how improving your awareness while you're playing cards so that you make better decisions in the moment and notice trouble spots that merit deeper consideration is one of the most valuable things you can do to make more money on the felt in my conversation with the only four-time wpt main event champion ever darren elias he told me that his ability to shut out all of the distractions in the world and fully focus on making great decision after great decision is his superpower he most attributes to his success. And you cannot improve your awareness at the tables without being fully present. When you learn how to stay fully in the moment on the green felt, you can finally have a clear path to becoming the absolute best version of yourself, which leads me to Jason Sue. Jason is one of the foremost authorities on the planet when it comes to playing poker with presence. As a matter of fact, he even wrote the book on it. Here's a direct quote from Nick Howard at Poker Detox on Jason's ability to help you stay focused. Quote, Jason's work is a new paradigm in poker and performance. End quote. And these aren't just empty words. Nick has put his money where his mouth is by hiring Jason to coach up the Poker Detox crew. And as a loyal listener of Chasing Poker Greatness, you know by now that I would not be promoting anything I didn't 100% believe would improve your poker skills and your life. So if you want to master your emotions and perform at your peak with presence while doing battle in the arena, you'd be doing yourself a grave disservice if you didn't check out Jason's work at PokerWithPresence.com. One final time, that's PokerWithPresence.com. Let's do lightning round really fast and uh, we'll get you out of here so you can go okay. study some more with Sean Dell. It's my <laughs> own little nut. 
<laughs> if you could gift all poker players one book to read, what would it be and why? Hmm. Um, it's been a while since I've actually uh, read a poker book. I think it doesn't have to be about poker. It could be about something else. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. I think uh, the first poker book that came to mind since when the question came up was uh, Winning Poker Hand- Tournaments One Hand at a Time. It's written by Ape Styles uh, and uh, a couple other players. It's been a while, actually. It's a three volume one. And I thought that was the first book I read that actually gave some great in depth kind of current um, stuff. I think if you're just starting out for poker, you know, you can't go wrong with the Harrington on Hold'ems to just get your basics and that kind of stuff. But I think that you need to branch off from that at some point. Um, so yeah, I think that would be kind of what I would think from that, from that one. Uh, nice. Sure. If you could, if you could wave a magic wand, change one thing about poker besides legalization and regulation in the U S <laughs> what would it be and why? If I could change one thing. I think that, uh, yeah, other than legalization, I just think the way to, to get it to be more mainstream, you know, I think that. We need to find a way to, to get more of the masses. I think we need more females. I think we need more um, people of all ethnicities and backgrounds and that kind of thing. I think uh, the vast majority of poker is just the same type of, of people. And I think – I don't understand why. I think this game could appeal to anybody. you know. And I think getting a broader audience and people realizing how great it could be um, could be good. I don't know how we open that up without – like you were saying, regulation, like getting it on TV and that kind of thing was a great thing. But other than that, I think it's great. I think for the most part, I think it's on a great place. I think uh, as a whole, um, poker's in a great place, especially you know, with all the tragedy and stuff going on, online poker right now is kind of seeing a resurgence, which I think is, is great. Um, and I think a lot of the poker sites online kind of handled that well. They, they up their guarantees. They, um, a lot of them are, are pretty responsive. Um, global poker acr you may not love everything that they do but they're very responsive and they you can reach out to phil Nagy directly he will reply to you on twitter that's kind of rare um so yeah i don't love global poker i'm neutral towards in the u.s market all the other ones i'm <laughs> the opposite side of neutral yeah uh but yeah. why mm-hmm. because poker should be about the players and not enough money is invested into protecting the player's interest and removing bots, removing real-time assistant software, making the experience good for just your, your average player that plays. I, I think that because there's no regulation, because there are no rules, I've said this many times, Online poker in the U.S. right now, because it's so wild westy, in the cash games especially, you don't see it as much as much in the tournament scene because it's a lot harder to cheat. But cheating is incentivized in sure. the in the cash game world because there's no punishment. What do you do? You get banned from ignition, and you just have to create a burner account, sure. and your money gets frozen. But basically, most of the cheaters are going to be keeping a super low balance. They're going to be prepared for this eventuality, and it's an uphill battle. So, to me, you know, saying you should just play more tournaments. (laughs) Maybe I should play more tournaments. But then, (laughs) like, I love cash, right? Like, cash game to me is is somewhat dying. You have a site like Bet Online that doesn't want to pay their bad beat jackpot. And and it's not until there's social pressure that they pay their bad beat jackpot. And then the poker world erupts and cheers because a fucking poker site paid a bad, they they did exactly what they're supposed to do. We're cheering this like this, like the bar is just so, so low. I'm also afraid that when poker does get regulated, what's going to happen is that it's going to be so expensive to get a license. They're going to stifle innovation. They're going to stifle a meritocracy where the sites that care about the players would get the would get them right. Like, there's this movement against pros that that I hate. Full tilt poker back in the day was play with the pros, right? That was the tagline, and it was one of the biggest and most successful sites in the world. And then you have and they the didn't pros. have all the gimmick stuff either, you know, like the the opening boxes stuff that like or chests and that sort of thing and all the gimmicky right. crap. I, I, 
I think that full tilt poker in a lot of ways is sort of like, uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, a spouse that you love very much that cheats on you. And then you just hate everything they do and everything they stood for. They did a lot of good things. And besides that whole embezzling thing, uh, it was great. Right? Besides, <laughs> besides the Ponzi, besides the fact that they couldn't manage money. And right. again, you know, without regulation, without regulation and legalization, it's hard to police an entity that is offshore. If, mm-hmm. if Nagy wants to disappear, you disappear tomorrow. what's stopping him? Yeah, nothing. Like, and full to this example too, like nobody ever saw that coming, right? They had every pro you could imagine and we all trusted everybody on that roster, the, the whole banner of people that was on there. How could that possibly go wrong? And it, it was horrifically, went horrifically wrong. Horrifically wrong. Yeah. And that had to do with the leadership of the company. Absolutely. And also it was, I assume they imagined, they didn't imagine that what was going to happen would happen. So they didn't have enough foresight to foresee something like that. At mm-hmm. the end of the day, they they got bailed out anyway by poker Sorry. stars. Yeah. And I just think that poker is aspirational. And when you start saying, as a website, we don't want winning players, what you're saying is, if you work hard in this meritocracy, if you devote yourself to a game, you study, you bleed, what's going to happen is we're going to make it impossible for you to win. So who cares? Why should I ever play poker? You play poker. I started playing poker because I thought it was a way to make a living mm. by playing cards, a game that I love. And um, so all these reasons to me is are I just can't endorse any online poker site because – the number one objective is to make as much money as they possibly can from each individual player. And it's not about providing a good experience. And there needs to be some sort of balance there, right? Where it's a good experience for the players and everything's fair and equal. And at the same time, the sites can make their money and, and, right. and be a business, right? Yeah. And there need to be consequences for cheating. People sure. need to go to jail. People need to get fined $100,000. There, there need to just be real consequences for the shenanigans and the bullshit that happens. You know, when so ACR then, tournament crashes, right? Like when the site goes down, there, there's no consequence other than people are like, ah, fuck ACR. But if they have an overlay, then I'm going to join back and play in it tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think there's got to be some balance there too because this is an internet world and, and shit like that happens. Is there an excuse on the drop for two months or three months? Absolutely not. Like they need to get a good IT team in there and probably fire the IT team that they have now, no doubt. Um, but that's also, I think it's interesting because even live, you know, uh, the Postal situation where he just got let go, even live, you know, you're not necessarily safe and there's not a lot of repercussion. Yeah, how do you like cheating? Right. And this is another case where Apostle is a shitty player that can't beat an average one, three game. And he cheated because I don't know how the situation got to where it was. I assume there was an opportunity Mm -hmm. and he jumped on board and allegedly, but the reality is like he was incentivized to cheat because what happened at the end of the day on a live stream that everyone can see what happened. He got the money, got the money, nothing happened to him. So, you know, that, I mean, there's some argument that he can't really walk into a card room and just play, right? Like there's some of that, but I don't even believe that because mm-hmm. I don't think people have too much to, to worry about, right. Then like policing these guys walking in and playing cards. It's just, why, why do the players have to police this shit? Why don't all the casinos yeah. ban him? Like, why is he even allowed? Why, like, why is he allowed to step foot? on the blacklist that they all right. talk about, right? Absolutely. Right. Like, and, and this is the, this is the, what drives me crazy about poker is like, yeah, it's hard for him to sit down at a poker table because the players are going to complain right. and it's the players are going to antagonize him. But shouldn't the fucking casino care? Yeah. Like, shouldn't they care enough to take that step voluntarily on their own? And what I see is no operator, no casinos just caring genuinely in the U S and the unregulated market about the players. And that to me is just bullshit. I hate it. How do you feel about a guy like Chris Ferguson who had that whole fiasco disappears for a bunch of years and then comes back and gets player of the year. And and, I'm less concerned about Chris Ferguson. Uh, I don't, I think again, this is just my opinion. I think Chris Ferguson, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I don't Mm -hmm. know that he had bad intentions. I think it's very possible. He's, 
sh- not the greatest with business. He's a shitty <laughs> business person. He's a good poker player and a shitty business person. <laughs> good, sure. Which is not exactly a stretch of a tail. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it fucking, it, it sucks. It's, it, it's a sucky situation. And I don't know. I, I just, I don't care about Chris Ferguson. The players were made whole. I don't think the intent was bad. My, the apostle situation, I think the intent was obviously was bad. Yeah. Um, I don't even care about Jungle Man, to be honest with you. I, I just, we need a better system. And until the priorities sort of get together and are in alignment, it's just, uh, have to look at, look at the poker landscape in the U.S. as it is. It's Wild West and it's every person for themselves. And if you don't look out for yourself, nobody's going to look out for you. So you have to do do everything yourself. Yeah, I think it's perfect. Very fair. I don't even know where we're at. We're in the lightning round. Lightning round. You... We talked about <laughs> one thing about the change in poker. Yeah, we uh, led me all, off into a tangent of why I just am not going to promote any site on my platform or any operator. Just I, it, I've just seen too much. I've experienced too much. You're right. I think I, I kind of fall into the category of kind of ignorance is bliss a little bit. And I just kind of sit and do my thing. And, and, and uh, I think I take some of that for granted. So I think you, you're absolutely right. You know, on all, on all fronts there. And I, I guess I'm just so used to having to police things myself that like, yeah, it becomes I mean? a normal like, a world where that, what that doesn't exist. It didn't even really, be, you know, isn't really a reality for me, which it should be. Right. right. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's the life of a poker player, yeah. whether you want it or not. If ultimate bet, uh, Russ Hamilton cheats you out of, you know, whatever it was, $75 million, the players through a God mode account, ultimate bet did not investigate the scandal. The players players did. The players found it. They policed it themselves. And that to me is just bullshit. Like it's just straight up bullshit that ultimate bet did not care enough to protect their players when this should be priority number one, protect the players. If you could erect a billboard that every poker player has to drive past on the way to the casino or maybe just on their way to their computer, very small billboard, what does it say? Hmm. What does it say? Um, these are good introspective questions. I wish I was, I was more prepared. Um, kind of drawing a blank on that one. I think uh, for the most part it would be you know, one thing I try to keep my mental game straight. So I have a t-shirt that I saw at, at Spencer's gifts of all places that I get. It just says like, uh, you need to learn, you need to let that shit go. Quote Buddha. And I think there's a lot of that. If you're, uh, you're going to play poker, we're talking about the grind and all that. I think that would be the one, you know, let that shit go and keep your mental game straight and, and keep your head in the game. And, and remember that this is a game that we love and not get so salty. Uh, be so bitter. This, there's so many bitter people. The guy gets his king's cracked and throws the cards at the dealer, berates a dealer for putting an ace on the flop and those kind of things. Or even a lot of without that kind of shit. Yeah, e- even worse than that are just the people who are unhappy when their friends find success or people that only want validation from the poker community at large. It's that true. And like I post a lot of my wins and my final tables, and I remember I I cracked the two hundred fifty thousand in winnings on on pocket fives way back when and I took a screenshot and I posted it and I was like, look, I'm proud. I, I got this little accolade and everyone's response was, yeah, but how much did you lose? I'm like, can we just celebrate the fact that we hit an accomplishment? Like I certainly didn't lose to a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and like everyone just wants to shit on you um, because they're so used to being miserable. I think that's a, I think it's a bit of the internet culture that we, that we live in and the troll culture that we live in. Yeah. People just like the shit on success and they're miserable. So they want you to be miserable too. Like because you're a representation of what they can't do. Right. And so they're going to be bitter. Um, which current big goal as related to poker? What's my current big goal? Yeah. Um, to get better every day is basically my, my ultimate goal. To be to better, better version be better of yourself. Every day. And I think that's in all aspects. Uh, work harder on my game. Uh, work hard on my mental game. Give back more. That's my ultimate goal. I think I'm really fortunate. Um, you know, I could always win more money. That's great. But I think in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm living my poker dream. I have a great you know, support group and I know some great people and I get to hang out with great people, you and, and all these other people. And, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. 
I think having gratitude for the things that we have is kind of the first step to not throwing the Kings when we get a bad beat, right? Just being grateful that we're in the arena, that we have the ability. I think that's something that people don't meditate on enough and realize that it's a gift of life to you find too, that like when you have a role that's nice and solid and you're playing the right stakes and you're not playing above your bankroll and you know, long-term you're a winning player. I think a lot of that saves me from tilt that this hand doesn't matter. This week doesn't matter. This month doesn't matter. I know at the end of 2020, I'm going to be profitable. I've been profitable every year for a long time. Um, sometimes great profitable, sometimes a little profitable, but I'm always profitable every year. And I think there's a lot of confidence in that. And I also realized that like, whatever the bad beat may be, it's definitely not the worst beat I've ever taken. And I've probably been beat that exact way a hundred thousand times in the past. You just right. uh, shrug it off and move on. Exactly. Buddha says, let that shit go. That's what the Buddha says. If the Buddha says it, let that shit go. I could be wrong. Speaking of giving back, what's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? Uh, the study stream. Uh, huge, 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 huge. Um, we do it every Saturday on Twitch. Um, me and Crazy Sixes host it, and we have guests sometimes. Sometimes we don't, but it's Time really to start. fun. Uh, noon Eastern. It's on both of our channels. And uh, yeah, that's been really amazing. The, the, the amount of praise that we've gotten from the public. Uh, people love it. People get a taste because like, I think a lot of people too, like, okay, I'm going to study poker and, and they look at their hands and they don't really know what they're looking at. The, the, yeah, I play this the way I always play. It looks good. Um, and they don't really know how to study. And like you said, like how to talk poker. Um, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. And I think we kind of give people a taste of what Crazy Six and I do on a daily basis and, and what good people are doing and, and, and that sort of thing. And then we bring guests that, get them in a chance to be interactive with people they don't get to talk to normally. Um, I love that. Um, it's so much fun. And on a selfish note, I get more reps in, so I just get better too. I love it. I love it. Right. I mean, it's, it's a, a giant service that you do to the poker community to have these study streams stream live on Twitch. Um, so, you know, that'll, that'll, that'll be linked in there. see like a micro player who's been playing. Uh, I had a, a guy who uh, has been watching my stream forever and he comes to the what he can you know he's got some time limitations some money limitations so he gets he invests as much as he can and i was talking to him and i made the assumption that he had like a few hundred dollar bankroll and i was like yeah you probably shouldn't be playing the stake he's like oh no no so i i put my roll up to five thousand dollars and i was like oh shit that's a incredible like you're playing 50 cent on demands like props to you that's amazing and he's ahead of of so much of the, the general public and that makes me feel warm inside when i see my guys that i coach hit, you know, for X amount of dollars. That that's always, that makes me feel good. I love doing that. Coaching is something I definitely love doing too. Yeah. Th there's a lot of pride in helping people, a lot of fulfillment in seeing the progression of someone from point A to point B to point C to point D. Mm -hmm. And again, when you are a coach of somebody, you're naturally invested into them and you are their cheerleader and their biggest fan and you wish nothing but the success on these players. And for me, in the poker world, this is one of the ways that has given me just tons of fulfillment that I don't really find just on the grind myself on a daily basis. Yeah, I have a, a, a student. Her name is Ginger, and she's a she's a really sweet lady, and she's got grandkids and stuff. We call her the Savage Grandma now. Three years ago, and she's one of those people who just comes to the once a month study group that I offer to my Twitch subscribers, and she she invests as much as she can. And um, just that little time and watching the stream when we first started three years ago, she limped every pot, and every bet was half pot, and that was it. And now she is scary as fuck. <laughs> she's like she'll be three betting and double barreling, and she'll be you check the turn, she's bombing the river, she's a pain in the ass, and uh, it's amazing. I, I love reviewing her hands. It's a, it's a great thing to see. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Savage grandma. Savage grandma. So uh, let's close it out. Where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, I'm everywhere. Uh, Facebook, God's Big Toe Poker. Uh, Twitter, God's Big Toe Poker. God's Big Toe Poker dot com. God's Big Toe on Where did that Facebook. come from, by the way? God's Big Toe. God, I wish I was actually going to have a competition so that someone could come up with a better a better uh, origin story and like give away a t-shirt or something, some coaching or something. So uh, tune in guys. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that eventually for sure. Uh, but what happened was, is it's kind of funny. Like you said, I was playing, I was a, I was a house player for a skin on the merge network. 
uh, way back in 2009, right when I was having all that success. And um, it gave me X amount of dollars. Again, I got to keep whatever profit I had. And then I tried to withdraw and I couldn't get my damn money off the site. And I had like two grand on it or something. And I, I tried to get it off. I think I still have $80 on that site to this day if it's still around. But I like tried to get the money off and I couldn't. And it took me a few months. And I was like, well, fuck this. I guess I'm just going to go play on a different site and eat this 2 a So I went over to Carbon Poker, which I didn't realize was another skin on the yeah, same Yeah, it's Merge. Network. It's the same network, yeah. And so I tried to use – my old screen name was Jamoki. And uh, I tried to use Jamoki, but I was blocked. I'm like, someone stole my screen name. I didn't realize I was blocking myself. And my wife asked me uh, what the silliest name I could think of was. And I just blurted out about three toe and then had some success. And now I'm just toe forever. Yeah. Now, yeah, now this, else. this is your screen name for life. Yeah. But yeah, Merge, another bad actor in the poker world. God, you know what's so funny is they were bigger than ACR at one point And like they were crushing it. And then they just made every mistake you could possibly make and have like five users on their, on their network now. A yeah. Tragedy. I... I can't remember exactly what happened, but merge lock poker, I managed to avoid because I think I read on two plus two people were waiting for their checks or people weren't getting paid. And, and three I was months like, to yeah. get your money. It took me nine months to get my money after they banned me. They sent me an email that said, your style of play is not conducive to the recreational player and then banned me. And then it took nine months to get my money. This just encapsulates all all the things that I said about about, <laughs> about the online poker. We we can't even imagine what a f- good world looks like where you can whip out a credit card, make a deposit on a site, it's protected, and then when you cash out, you cash out and it goes right to your bank account. We can't even imagine this happening in places where poker is not legal. Like, yeah, and I think a lot of time people like uh, people who aren't like you and I from pre Black Friday, like, don't realize the good days back then when I mean, we maybe were a little ignorant to what was going on behind the scenes, but it was so easy and available, and fields were huge and every day. But it e- wasn't even easy to cash out even back then. You know, it, yeah. when Net Teller went away with Party Poker, I I, I would just get like three thousand dollar checks in the mail yeah. and get questioned at my country, bank you know, you from another country, kind of, yeah, and like yeah. I felt like a criminal constantly like getting a check should be a good feeling should be a good thing. And I would just get a sense of dread that I would have to go to the bank and answer a bunch of questions about where this check came from. Lie about where you got it. Lie about where I got it. I'm a consultant in Singapore. Like that makes any sense to anybody, but like whatever. And you just reminded me like how things have always been shitty, huh? We need need, (laughs) Things have always been shitty. We just don't realize how shitty it is because we're used to shittiness. Right. (laughs) I hope that one day I I would love to invest all of my time and energy into a platform that cares about the players, that I can have a hand in facilitating a product that I'm proud of. I would love to devote all my time and energy into such a venture. It's so hard to start up your own site like just to get people there, right? And to get guarantees that are juicy. Like It's so hard to start from, from scratch. I think it's one of those weird things where getting started is really hard, but if you have an audience, you know, if you just do things well, it'll just be an ATM machine that prints you money. Just do things well. I just think like I would be fine working with a poker operator with a poker platform to improve what they're doing. Like that would be, that would be fine with me. Just some, some way where I can contribute to a better world for poker players. Because it's actually heard. Sure. As it stands, we just, take whatever they give us and have no recourse and that's it. And that to me is bullshit. And like, if we want poker to be great, we need to get closer to something that's beneficial for all of the players. And um, yeah, it's a, it's tough sledding. It's a tough road. I've went off on the tangent again after (laughs) one, the one last question question, Jared, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you very, very much. Um, all of your links I'll, I'll put in the show page, the time for you and Shondell's study sessions, all this stuff, and come back on in the next year or so. Yeah, anytime. I'm, I was honored that you uh, reached out and invited me, man. Uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm humbled and appreciative and realize how blessed and lucky I am. So uh, I really thank you, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, thank you for having me. Anytime. My pleasure. Take care, dude. Take care, buddy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. 
If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.